Hey everybody, welcome once again to Realms Remembered. I am your host panion, as I like to think of it, Michael T. Bradley. Here with you again to talk about a bunch of different books. You know, again, sorry it's been a while since I uh, updated. I've actually been reading for a campaign here lately, which is crazy, I know. Uh, I'm finally running something again. It's been a while. It's kind of frustrating because I really, really wanted to run some Realm stuff. I, I have yet to try out 4E, and I really think it looks uh, very good, and I would like to try it. And I just got uh, the Neverwinter accessory, and uh, it looks really awesome, and I have this other idea that I think I could work with it, and blah, 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 blah. But uh, the group that I'm with decided to play Call of Cthulhu, which I'm cool with because Cthulhu happens to be my favorite role-playing system. So I'm totally cool with that, but it's a little frustrating. Hopefully at some point I will try out 4E in the form of either Realms or Gamma World, both of which I have and I'm excited to try out. I also have this giant Dark Sun campaign that I plan to run one day that I've started a couple of times. Dark Sun is what I cut my role-playing teeth on. So uh, a lot of a lot of memories there. Just a very quick backstory. Skip over a minute or two if you don't care. Dark Sun was the first game uh, I ever ran. Totally didn't understand what role playing was. Uh, also didn't understand things like game balance. So our Dark Sun party had a Terrasque in it, and we were spell jamming by the third or fourth session, I think. So uh, not not really. <laughs> I mean, it was awesome. Don't get me wrong. But it wasn't really what you might consider a uh, fair, balanced game that made any sense. All right, on to the realms. Let's talk about some stuff that we're going to skip before we get to any actual reviews, uh, because I think that'll be easier. So I'm going to start a little later and then work my way back, simply because uh, I want to read a couple of quotes while I have them out here. The Druid Home Trilogy, Prophet of Moonshay, The Coral Kingdom, and The Druid Queen. I went ahead and gave this another shot, even though I had skipped the original Moonshay Trilogy, whatever it's called. Because, you know, sometimes authors just have to, like, settle into a world or whatever before they get comfortable with it. It doesn't necessarily reflect on how they are as authors themselves. So the end, I think this is David Cook. No, this is Doug Niles. I was going to say I like David Cook's Horse Lords, but just somewhat similar name. Really nothing alike at all. But I went ahead and gave this a shot, and I think it's better than the Moonshade trilogy, but that's not saying much. It still really feels like... Like, it's the difference between writing characters and the feeling of puppets standing around spouting lines of dialogue. I don't know if that makes sense. It went from, like, a 5th to a 7th grade writing style, though, which is an improvement. So, if he has some later stuff, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think, like, the druid stuff comes back anymore. But if there is any later stuff, maybe I, I'll get around. I'll, maybe I'll give that a shot. Just to give you a couple of examples, the, this isn't the like puppet spouting dialogue stuff, but just a couple of examples of the uh, writing style in here. A couple of my favorite quotes. Instead, Earl Blackstone found the third mysterious occurrence to be far more sinister, its portents more evil. Just digest that. Okay, and another one, this, this is probably my favorite. Soaring like a flying thing. <laughs> because... That's how things soar, as if they were flying. So, skip that. Also skip 1364, The Veiled Dragon. That was kind of weird, because I usually really like Troy Denning. I liked the original one. Totally blanking on the name now. I'm inserting this in here because I recorded this entire thing and then realized, holy crap, I totally forgot that I haven't done a review of Part C yet, which is the first one that I couldn't remember the title for, of uh, Troy Denning's Ruha stuff in the Harper series. The Part C, I enjoyed, but here's the thing, it's another one of these really odd Realms books that's like, you know, written for adolescent males uh, as the main demographic, all about what it means to be a woman and specifically what it means to be like a Bedouin wife. What that entails and like the secrets you have to keep from your husband if you can cast magic, which I'm sure you could really just write as a metaphor for damn near any horrible thing you wanted to. And by horrible, if it's sexy, I mean awesome. 
so this is essentially a book about uh, this male Harper, his name's like Lando or Lander or something like that, who comes into the desert because the Zentarim are going to try to take over the desert and use it as a trade route. I, it's, it's something like that. They're going to take over like all of the Bedouin tribes and make them their slaves and trade route and blah, 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 blah. It's kind of odd because it's like the Harpers are working against imperialism, even though they're kind of based near the Cormier area and everything, which seems to be imperialism, but whatever. Point being, it focuses on Lander and Ruha, who is a witch, but she has to keep this secret because, you know, all these tribes hate witches because magic's icky. Lesbianism? I don't know. It, it could be anything. Anything. You could just metaphor the crap out of it. Point being, Ruha's newly married to, like, cement this thing between tribes and also kind of for her dad to get rid of her because he knows that she can do magic. She's trying to be a good wife, da 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 da, -da and then, like, her entire tribe that she's now a part of is slaughtered and her husband included, so this sets off this wild escapade of adventures and she gets involved with Lander trying to protect their way of life. Another thing that this has in common with a lot of these books is this just horribly tragic sort of section to it like I, I I was reminded really heavily of City of Angels because it's like the first time Ruha and Lander boink like they, they get close enough I, that's horrible because it's so romantic and I feel bad for saying boink now but I was trying to keep this PG-13 the first time they make sweet love like the next day Lander is murdered horribly and it's like he gets this vision of um, a melaki i think because i think he's like a nature dude coming to him and you know he's like oh my god like i screwed this woman over and i'm dying because i you know <sighs> okay pg-13 metaphor i sullied her chased ah <sighs> yeah <laughs> i'm tempted just to put a bleep noise in here and let you imagine because you know we did that and She's like, no, 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 you helped the woman through the grieving process, and then you were stupid and you got stabbed with a poison knife. Anyway, let's go off and frolic in the afterlife now. But it's really difficult to read. I mean, it's he's just this kind of like, whatever fantasy protagonist, but holy crap, I mean, that's rough. <laughs> these books are a little too emotionally gripping for me in these parts, because I'm like, geez, man, this person died too? Of course, if this had been the Night Parade, you know, he would have been, like, number 736 to die. There are a couple of other people who die, but you kind of expect them to die because they're kind of like the side people. So, yeah, really good experience. Now back to what I recorded earlier, the desert thing with Ruha. But this one, it was like, I, I think it was like three chapters and them fighting like a frickin' turtle in the sea and then they were in the sea and blah. It just, I, I didn't care. I just didn't feel like it was going anywhere at all, so I just gave it up. Silver Shadows. This is the third, I believe, in the, uh, oh, I don't know what it's called, but it's the Aaron Moonblade or whatever story. And here's what's weird. We'll, we'll get back. I, I really should have done this in the other order, but I just wanted to get through the stuff that I'm skipping first. Uh, we'll get back to uh, Elf Song here in a moment. But I really liked Elf Song, and then this, at first I really liked it because we had some stuff with Blackstaff's wife, which was interesting. But uh, uh, then it just went to Erilyn, and I was like, God, I don't care. And like we see the other side of Erilyn's discussion with Danilo, or whatever the hell his name is. We see the other side of that, and what's going on with her and Tether and how that plays out and I just anytime she's on screen I just get annoyed and like start tapping my foot so I started to like it at first the first couple of uh, like the prologue or whatever um, is with uh, Blackstaff's like wife like hanging out with this elf chick and like has this really homoerotic overtone to it and that was just interesting because it started to feel like a continuation of Elf Song like this huge cast of characters and we find out more about different people and, and their backstories and everything and then we just skipped Erlen and god I'm bored so hell with that also skipped in 1365, Stormlight. I was curious to find out more about, what is it, Storm Silverhand or whatever, which sounds like a dude's name. I mean, I'm sorry, I guess it's a chick, but it really sounds like a dude's name, so that was tough. And then beyond that, it's just simplistic overwriting. It just didn't do anything for me. That might even be Greenwood writing that, which I guess I should have known better, but uh, yeah, I didn't even look. I just gave it a shot, and it was like, ah, this isn't, this isn't good. <laughs> So let's talk about a couple of books that I did actually read. First, let's talk about Ring of Winter from 1362. I think this is James Louder, whose stuff is kind of hit or miss for me. This was odd because it fell into a weird sort of, eh, 
in moderate realm. This is probably the last of the ones that I thought was okay that I actually read all the way through. Ring of Winter is essentially about a man chasing the Ring of Winter, which is this magical artifact, and he chases it to Chult, and he finds out that it's there, but, you know, there's a price attached to it, and la di da di da Here's my main problem with this book. It's not bad, per se, and it's written in an engaging way, and one event leads to the next in, in a way that's believable and interesting, I think. But it kind of seemed like it wanted to be a bit of a Chult gazetteer, if you will. Like, the entire kind of point of writing this was to showcase Chult. And if you strip away a few things here and there, it just seems like, in the end, it's about this one city that could be a city anywhere on Toril. So, I... I feel like it wasn't a bad book, but it failed in what it wanted to do overall. I mean, there are like goblin tribes and crap, and that's like the main problem. It's, I, you know, it turns into a decently fun, like, siege story at the end, and there's enough politics and whatever to keep you interested, but again, change a few minor details and I don't see why it couldn't happen almost anywhere in the realms. So yeah, mixed feelings on that. The other one that I'll talk about that I was really pleasantly surprised by and just shocked by, and especially after I've just talked about Silver Shadows, as it will be shocking, is Elf Song. Elf Song was incredible. Elf Song was so far beyond what most of the uh, Realms books are. I'll admit it didn't like speak to me personally or really engage me in a way that, say, the Finder's Bane stuff did but it, it was just really well done. One of the things that I really liked that I touched upon earlier is the fact that there's a huge cast of characters. Obviously, Danilo, I'm pretty sure that's his name, Danilo and his group are the main party, and their quest is kind of the focus of the book. But a lot of times we go back and see what, I can't remember his full name, Karen... Azu Hand or something, but Blackstaff, the, the guy in Waterdeep, that dude, we, we go back and see what he's doing, and like, he gets this awesome fight that's really only about half a chapter, but it has the feeling of like, Gandalf versus Christopher Lee, whatever, the Count Dooku, whatever the hell his uh, name was in that thing, just like, comes out of nowhere, but it's, it, it feels right, and it feels epic, and, and you really get a scope of like, what the bad guys are doing, and what it means, a little frustrating that it all comes down to song magic. I find that really, really ridiculous in a lot of ways, but like the uh, the kind of antagonist of the book, I don't want to say bad guy, but the antagonist of the book rides around on this like magical unicorn thing that only allows people of a good alignment to ride them, and, and like there's this kind of like moment where the mount is unhappy with her, and, and she's like, crap, I am still seeking justice and not revenge, right? And it just, it, it really feels much more layered and interesting than uh, a lot of the Realms books. I mean, I don't mind, you know, every Everybody fighting against the big evil or uh, the Zentarim, like, you know, in the shadows, ma ha 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 ha, every now and then. But it can get a bit tiresome if your heroes aren't interesting. And Elf Song just juggles this amazing sort of feat of keeping about eight or nine decently main characters interesting and uh, doing stuff at all times. I'll admit a couple of the elves I got mixed up because like Danilo's traveling with like one elf who's kind of a dick and has a moonblade of his own that doesn't work and this other elf who's going to teach him like elf song magic or whatever. But in any case, yeah, just a really really solid, really good book. As I say, it it didn't like speak to me emotionally or personally in the ways that a couple of them have so far. And it's not exactly rollicking good fun, but it's just solid, like just impressive. And what a shock after just not liking anything that Cunningham has done so far. This is probably, I would put it at one of the top two or three books that I've read so far chronologically in this series. I mean, there are things that come later where I'm like, okay, that blows it out of the water, but we're not there yet, so I'm not gonna bring those up. So yeah, this definitely one of the highlights of uh, what we've read so far. I think that's it for now. I'm just gonna leave it be there. Excited to get uh, some more stuff done. I have one more that I can do after this and then there might be a hiatus since, as I say, I'm kind of busy reading for the actual game that I'm running now, which is weird because I haven't done that for a while. But yeah, still enjoying this and hope to see you again soon. Realms Remember.